Okay, I am Kim. I'm working for Hitachi Linux Technology Center. I'm very honored to be here to talk about my project, BESPA. It's standing for Virtual Embraced Space Prober. As the name says, it's, uh, it's kind of a probing technology for virtualization environment. So in my talk, I first uh, talk about the background, why we developed the BESPAR, and in the short talk on concept of construction of BESPAR, and uh, for third, we show some demos instead of in implementation explanation. And if uh, time allowed, I show you information on BESPAR efficiencies. The background. It's a clustering virtual machines is a very interesting issue in system administration field, also in virtualizations. But we consider uh, the two point for clustering virtual machines. First one is a cluster model, which is about how to set up cluster with the virtual machines. The other is a monitoring method, which is about how to help stack virtual machines on the cluster nodes. It is likely to be dependent to the model, and uh, but uh, however, we have uh, Linux HL called Heartbeat uh, showed us already some solution for virtual or uh, clustering virtual machines. So first we talk about uh, uh, Heartbeat, and then I'm uh, I'm first talk about the uh, uh, the Heartbeat. The Heartbeat is a cluster manager tools and pair over load balance support. And the main feature is a clustering resource manager which deploys resources on the proper cluster node if a switch over and fail over needed. And the, what is a cluster uh, resource in Heartbeat? It, uh, every component needed to provide service to users, such as IP and the demo process, something like that. In the first, uh, I look at the cluster model in Heartbeat. The, in Heartbeat, the virtual, virtual machines are treated as resources because of a simple, simple manageability. Because it is very clear, in this model, it is very clear that which gas is running on which machines from the manager. And the, the new concept is for Heartbeat. And compared to conventional way, it is very clear in the which gas running on which machines from the manager. So it's a very superior architecture from the manageability viewpoint. So and next uh, I'm talking about the monitoring way in Heartbeat. Heartbeat monitors uh, virtual machines by polling way. It, Heartbeat send health check message periodically to check virtual machines health. So when failure happened, the heartbeat cannot find out what happened to, until the next polling cycle. So, so far, I'm talking talked about the heartbeat solution for clustering virtual machines. But one question lies here, in it, which is heartbeat way of monitoring is efficient enough? I'm sorry? It's a depending on the service type. So you can adjust 10 seconds, one, one second, or something like that. And uh, it, how to beat a way of our monitoring is a, ha, a, has some shortcoming exist as in the cluster of physical server systems. So one is a response, response latency because of periodic, uh, periodic polling way. And the, the other is uh, we don't have any method to find out why failure, o failure occurred in a detailed way. So, <clears throat> so we are wondering if uh, there are other health check sources to improve on the latency and the failure analysis. So we, our suggestion is probing virtual machines instead of the polling way. The probing virtual machines can provide response latency improvement because of a probe 
Prof's uh, event-driven characteristic. When a uh, failure happened around the probe, probe notified the failure to the cluster manager on the host immediately. So immediate detection of failure is possible. Also, <coughs> also probing virtual machines provide failure analysis facilities with a well-written probe handler. Probe handler is a report the detailed parallel to the cluster manager, so which give us some hint on wh why it's a failure happen in a detailed way. It's from memory pressure or network congestion. You can find out. Now, <coughs> I'm talking about the, what features of a probing technologies needed for probing virtual machines in terms of a high ability. We should probe anywhere we want because probing point should be changed according to service type you want to monitor. And then it, we should insert probe and dynamically because uh, the, we cannot stop service for inserting probing in terms of high abilities. And then we should insert and delete probe from host, from the manageability of viewpoint, because the cluster manager is installed on the host. Also, we should access probe date from host. The same reason with the same reason, because the cluster manager is installed on the host. It, 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 upper two requirement. Uh, K-Props is a, does good job. K-Props is a, the Linux kernel infrastructure to, to probe kernel spaces, kernel space uh, events. And the next two requirement, we need a new framework. So we developed the passports, which is the framework to handle K-Props on the virtual environment. And the concept. Our VESPER is, uh, is a framework to provide the controllability of probing modules. There is a two road probing module from cluster manager to the guest corner space. And the other is uh, the accessibility to the probe date. There is a transport probe date from guest to host by a virtual file systems. So cluster manager can the file uh, read the operation to get detailed information about guest house. So our de design decision for a uh, universal baseball is uh, we adopt a spirit driver model. It's a very common way implementing drivers in virtualization technology. And the uh, interesting feature for baseball is uh, baseball doesn't use guest user space when loading modules because uh, we want to insert modules even though a user space is gone on the host. And uh, we, we use a system top also to, to uh, build probing modules easily. You don't have to uh, k-probes handle it from scratch in C language because the system top is a, it's a kind of a script language so you can easier uh, just uh, uh, writing C language from scratch better, better than C lang uh, from scratch in new C languages. So this is the base structure for Vesper. You see the, in, the, in the center, we see two spirit driver. One is a probe loader. It is a two loader modules, loader, uh, loader probing modules into guest corner, and the other is a probe listener. It is to listen to what the probe module is talking about the guest corner space has. And also you can see the system tab and user, a best for user interface in the user space to build uh, probing modules and to load the modules with the help of a probe loader. And the loaded probing modules and write 
at all information about the guest house uh, through the probe listener. And the probe listener on the host push up all data to the cluster, uh, cluster manager. There is a, a whole cycle of uh, best balls, and I show you some demos at the, from how to, how to build a kernel modules with the system top and how best ball works. So we have a this one host, and the, this is guest guest console. And from host, the first. First, we activate the best framework by this script, and the, it make uh, probing modules. Now the system topping is a translate the script the two kernel modules. And if the script is is a simple the three lines, it is for the probing sending send a signal kernel pass. It's just it's very simple. And now at the now is the insert at probe modules to the gas. So we insert probe modules. So you can see it is a, is a loaded in the gas. So now here at now I the I generate signals to uh, HTTP demos. And the, the signals is uh, uh, send it to the host. can catch the signals the centered from gas. The, this is the cycle is a baseball, how, how baseball works. So when it stopped, you can also get the signals from gas. In this way, Best pulse is uh, very efficient to uh, get gas uh, uh, health information from uh, gas. And this is uh, uh, the, the test bed to evaluate how best pulse is efficient. When we have, a, you prepare two physical machines, one active, one at the other is a standby. In active, we have a gas, two gas. And one is a 
uh, monitored by a conventional way, and the gas two is monitored by probe, probe with the passport. The result is the we can see the response rate has improved in 50 percent. So we can verify the verify the passport efficiency. So Vespers, it can use system top for users. Vespa can uh, use system top for usability. Also, Vespa can improve pair over latency and they improve the failure analysis. I mean, Vespa can get uh, detailed information about the cast house. That's uh, all I have. Thank you. Just um, switch uh, computers, just take a minute. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do here is review uh, Mondo Rescue and using in a Pixie based environment. So, Mondo Rescue is a backup and recovery tool. It creates, you take, run it on your server and it creates a bootable image of your server. You can then boot that image and it recovers your hard drive to what it was previously. It's very much uh, DR orientated, uh, it backs up your operating system and your applications. It's not the sort of thing you use to back up your Oracle database, things like that. Uh, traditionally speaking, you can use it to, it'll write the ISO images to a DVD, a CD-ROM, or a USB, or in the case I'm looking at here, you write it to a network file system, and then boot, boot back via that network file system in Pixie. So this is how you create a backup. First of all, you mount your little file system file system, then you run your Mondo archive program and that just tells it to create the files on that file system in that file system directory. Um, this is this P is just tells you the, na the name it uses for a prefix, um, otherwise it uses a default. Uh, this in theory le le lets you change the names occasionally. Um, you can also have the operation option of differential backup. So once a week you back up everything and then every night you would back up just a small portion of that. Then when you recover, you boot the full thing, then you boot the differential one, and everything's in sync without having to do a full backup every day. There's a couple of limitations. I'll go over them a bit later. Uh, size is just the size of the ISO images. Ne in network space systems, in theory, it doesn't matter. In practice, I keep it fairly small because it will create a temporary file on your root file system or whatever this big and if it's ten, 4 gig it might overflow something. Uh, N is an option to uh, not back up any network file systems you have m m mounted on that machine which is usually a good idea and G is gzip which I'll go over in a minute. So here's what it looks like. It just um, gets a list of files on your file system, takes a, few, takes a minute or two, creates a bunch of ISOs and then, uh, fin and then writes them to the, to the remote file system. So um, takeaways from this, it backup takes three minutes to about 20 minutes on a typical few gigabytes server. Um, the gzip option is quite good for network stuff. It's 10% bigger, but you don't care because it's not an ISO, uh, it's not a disk or something. It's 30% faster in my experience and it has a lower CPU impact. Under the default bzip system, the CPU runs he very heavy. Um, 
and uh, the differential backups, one bug I, I've found with them is that if you do a full backup, delete a file, then do a differential backup, then recover both those, the file deletion isn't recorded in the differential backup, so you'll have that file back on your system after a recovery. This may or may not affect you. Uh, Pixie booting, um, you should know how it works. Um, there's plenty of how-tos online. Uh, my advice is get memtest86 to work. Once you get that working, it's sweet. Uh, my advice of uh, Pixie booting things is to use Pixie Linux, uh, which is downloadable from the SysLinux website. It's got nice little extended features, cute bits and pieces, and it's a bit nicer than what will come default with your uh, operating system. Uh, so you can do cute things like silly menus to uh, Mondo boot and all that sort of thing. Um, so this is this one does. I can do a automated restore, or an automated differential, or a, or a slightly more manual one, and plus a couple of normal boot options. Uh, so this is uh, what the uh, Pixie Linux entry looks like for each of those. One of those. So you've got the label. Uh, the kernel is just uh, a kernel that comes in Mondo. Just extract that from a loop mounted ISO. The init RD the same. And there's a ton of append options, which I'll go over in a sec. So these are important ones. Uh, there's this magic option here. Just put this in, or else if you use any recent kernel, it'll just not work, because it's too big. <laughs> and you'll get a very interesting error. Uh, this is all the bit you need to change between servers. Just, just, just uh, at the end, maybe. Uh, just the NFS mount path and the prefix. Um, script this using your favorite method. And this Pixie just tells Mondo it's running via Pixie. Um, and that's what the whole line looks like, which is a hideous mess, but it doesn't most of it doesn't change. Uh, so this is what it looks like after it boots up. It sits there probing modules. Potentially, you're going to move from one piece of hardware to the next, so it actually probes all sorts of RAID disks and things like that, so it takes a bit longer. Um, you come up with a nice thing. This is just the automatic install. You'll probably do this most of the time. Um, so it partitions the disk, formats, the dis formats each partition, and then chugs away, restoring all the files. And then at the end, it says, hey, I'm finished. <laughs> now, um, so there's a couple of cute little options. Nuke doesn't ask the dumb question at the start, because you don't care. Um, but it will ask the questions at the end. So what I've done is last week I had to clone a couple of machines that I don't have a nice automated install for, me bad. Um, and so what I did was I just cloned one machine, restored it, to a new, restored it to a new piece of hardware, then at the end I went in and mounted the disk and changed the IP and the host name and a couple other things and then just brought it up, cloned the machine in half an hour. Um, it's not best practice, but it works okay. Uh, restore is this cute undocumented option, capitals, uh, that doesn't ask any questions at the start, doesn't ask any questions at the end. You boot it to that, walk away, it'll do all the install, reboot, and in theory the computer comes up all ready to go. Um, watch out for the ACP, APM things on your hardware maybe. Uh, take away to restore, it takes 5 to 20 minutes, slightly faster than save. Um, you can use the nuke for the manual. So you can restore the different hardware. You can save a box that's on an 80 gig machine, 80 gig drive, restore to a 160 gig drive, get in the manual options, and you make every partition grow to double size or something like that. Same with slightly different RAID controllers, things like that. Cute little things. And LVM aware, which is good. Um, overall takeaways for the software it's maintained improving software, regular releases. There's a reasonably good mailing list. Um, it's really good for DR restores. You can do cheap and nasty cloning. Um, on the website, there are up-to-date packages of the latest releases for most versions of Linux, about five versions of Red Hat and CentOS. Um, the track FAQ, if you actually use this, the track FAQ is a lot more up-to-date than the main FAQ. Read the track FAQ after the main FAQ, it'll probably answer all your questions that you're actually doing rather than the software two years ago. Um, and when you're running it, it'll give estimates of how long it's going to take to do something. Um, those are rough estimates. Just basically you have to test it, get a feel for how long it takes. 
It might say it's got 10 minutes to go, it'll take two minutes. Um, overall, it's, I'm really happy with it. It took me a week of playing around and I'm pretty good. Um, but two days of that were, two or three days of that were trying to find silly bugs in the documentation. So, but I recommend it. Um, and here's a couple of links to the software. Okay. My questions. Uh, it's because uh, kernels are bigger than one meg or something modern Red Hat and other kernels, and so therefore you have to tell it to use block space or, that, or else it says it has negative two billion bytes to install your kernel in or something insane. It's in the FAQ, but you end up having to put it in. Any other? It's Linux, effectively. It'll. What, you mean it supports all operating systems? Yeah, well, up to reasonable. Well, you just install it in pa as packages. So packages, it saves your, it saves your, it saves your uh, boot partition. Yeah, your partition table. It saves your disks partition raw, and then it saves all the files on it, and then it just restores those in reverse in that order. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, when it's running, it's running in RAM, and it just takes this disk and just chucks a partition table on it, formats the disks, and then chucks the files on the disk. So when it's growing, it actually tells us it's going to RISER I don't know. I mean, if you want to run RISER 2, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of them support growing. EXT3 um, and all the cute ones, SGI ones. Not all of them support growing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one or two more? Or any more questions? Sorry? Uh, your kernel basically has to support it, but the, the Mondo kernel is fairly wide, and most modern kernels are, will support anything. But so, I mean, you know, if it requires a particular module and it won't boot on it, it's your bad luck. So you just sort of you have to plan ahead, but it's reasonably okay. As far as I can tell, you can't back up from an LVM snapshot. I had a look around, and I couldn't find an option to easily do that. It's popped into my head, but I couldn't see anything. Yeah, but then you have to type more than two commands. Uh, yeah, it's I couldn't see the option, so yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Yes, it's your turn to talk. <laughs> I'm here to uh, sorry. I'm here to talk about what I've been doing, which isn't very much, I'm afraid. So you can all go to sleep now. Other evils there may come yet. It is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succour of those years upon which we are set. Gandalf said these out of uh, in Lord of the Rings for a particular purpose and the purpose I'm trying to uh, bring to your attention today and that is that we are paid gentlemen to think and ladies if there are any in the room we are paid to think and I have been at the butt end of some fairly poor thinking recently and so it has been a, a, a seriously on my mind. So how do we go about thinking? Well, I, was, I had some military training, so I was taught uh, as a, a section commander to do situation, mission, execution, administration, command and control, which is just one of many tools that you can use to apply to a problem, to sit back there and analyse what you're doing. Essentially, you want to know what the situation is, that is, you gather in hand all the resources. In my particular case, um, I have a a mate I've run into over the years called Dr Paul Turner who heads up the 
e-research group at the Information of Technology in Tasmania. And he has a vision uh, splendid of, of sunlit planes, extended, I'm afraid. He wants everything and he wants it yesterday. He had got together a group of people who had done a lot of .NET programming and they'd built for him a mobile phone system which would allow him to send a mobile phone message to an Oracle database. It used a Windows 2003 server to receive the message and it takes the, uh, the message and passes it on into Oracle based on Linux. This is to keep it simple, obviously. Uh, I think we've probably covered most of the technologies you might think of um, and certainly we've had a lot of fun. When I came along, most of this stuff was originally in place. Uh, I think the original um, deployment, just to make it easier, was in fact on OS X for the Oracle. Uh, that had, I think, was my, part of my original involvement was um, fixing up the mess when they tried to move it to Linux and didn't know what they were doing. Right. So, that when I talked about the situation mission... Ex, uh, execution, administration, command and control, that's talking about what we call tactical, how we actually fix the problem. But one of the issues here was that nobody had done any strategic thinking. Longer term, you do want to keep it simple. You really want to look at what you are doing and think about how you are going to maintain it. And I'll bring out the list in a minute of just how many pieces of separate software we're actually running in all that. Okay, what happened was Paul Turner, as I said, came along and said, we've got a bit of an issue, but we've got lots of .NET programmers, we've got lots of Oracle support people, um, we just need you to sort out the bit of the mess with the, the Linux system. Okay, we'll support you all the way, just go and fix that little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a military technique that's been used for many years. Go and watch Zulu, if you like. We'll send reinforcements. You just hold the line there. We'll send them in a minute. We've got lots of resources. They're all ready. They'll come as soon as you call. Um, as you could probably gather from that, I think at the moment there's me and there's a 16-year-old working on this project, and that's it. The rest of them, because, of course, Oracle people are, are, are very valuable people to have and have been poached. The .NET people are also very valuable people to be... And, uh, of course, this project is running on a, on a university project level, so... Financing is, uh, shall we say, skint. So there we are, we're we stuck with it. We, we, we promised these people who are old mates that we'll support their stuff. So learn to say no. Learn to do that strategic thinking when they come and say, it's only a little job. It's never a little job. Your responsibility for, for the whole world rests on the fact that we have IT infrastructure that stays up, that is secure. Any quick analysis of 2009 tells you that it's moved from we hate Microsoft and we've written a virus to we think we can make a lot of money by pilfering people's accounts when they sign in to online banking or buy something off eBay. Okay? It's security has got to be a big part of what you do this year. You've got to keep your eyes peeled. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all. So, what have we actually got it's an open source talk, so we're running as much open source as we could get our hands on. We're running Apache's version 1.2 and 2 on the same server because Oracle, in its wisdom, runs a 1.2 server system and, of course, Red Hat Linux runs a 2. Uh, just to keep me on my toes, I'm sure. We're running Java of several variations. We're running JavaScript. Who knows whether that's open source or not, but you can read it. Orc said GCSE Vim. Icecast for doing HL7 transcript stuff. Camino and Opera and Firefox. Grease Monkey plugins. Firebug. Something called Apex Builder plugin, which if you actually ever get to use um, Apex, which is the front end to Oracle databases, get the Apex Builder plugin run by a band called Patrick Wolf, who really knows what he's talking about mostly. Uh, some University of Tasmania built uh, proxy passing software it's called Squidman. Very useful if you work inside the university. GIMP now offers Eclipse, Python and of course Mono. Mono is the, the thing where you can run .NET on a Linux system. Marvellous. Very useful except that uh, of course if you're using .NET um, Mono with Oracle 
running through Apache, the only way we found, or the only way the people before me had found to make it work was to hard code into Apache CTL a call to load the Oracle paths. Of course, the next time, of course, that we ran the update on, on Apache and clo it clobbered the Apache CTL file, we sat there scratching our heads for days trying to work out why a perfectly functional system had suddenly died and could no, one, no one could resurrect it. Anyway, so there's also heaps of free software we could run. SQL Developer, the uh, Data Manager tool. Uh, there's the some virtualization tools that we can download We've seen some in thing. Application Express itself, which is a free download. In fact, Oracle is free if you want the uh, non-commercial use type version. And all sorts of example Apex applications. And then all the proprietary things sitting on top of that. Oracle with its mod PL, PL SQL, which is the Apache module that makes it all work with Apex. The Red Hat Enterprise Linux 4 update stuff when it's... Windows 2003 server, which causes, as you can imagine, the most grief. But we think we've tracked it down. It was probably mo 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 the Nokia mobile phone's cable being faulty. <laughs> as you can see, as, as I'll go back to my original thing, when you get given something, have a look at it. If you can simplify anything, do. We're, we are looking at the process of getting rid of the 2003 server and pulling it all back under Linux. But that process, having started gone down in .NET direction, having very limited access to the source code for which they used to design it, and having no drivers particularly for the, uh, the system to pick up the SMS messages coming in off the mobile phone, this all means extra work down the track for us. And as I say, a, an example of not very bright thinking at all. OK, there are, I think, you'll be all aware uh, in, the, in that great mass of things, some really nasty updating issues. Um, I don't know how anyone in here actually use Oracle at all. We've got quite a number of them. So be aware of what's involved in applying the CPU sets that Oracle brings out. Talk to one of those people if you want to find out what can go wrong or what you need to read. Pages and pages of stuff and you better get it right, basically. There are, um, there are a number of other things I'd like to say about each one of you going back to trying to look at what we're trying to achieve with particularly online databases, which is the big growth area. There are a significant dearth of good design models for data structures that sit behind it. One of the issues with Oracle it's an extremely powerful piece of software, but it is fairly insecure out of the box, and the designs which you load into the database are fairly sparsely to be had. Um, we need, I think, probably as a community of open source people to look at ways of developing best practice databases. So, should I want to represent a person and an event and some other bits and pieces to do with that, some property values, some location things, that we have a good model that we have in the public domain which we can use to share between applications and between websites and make de rapid deployment of this kind of system a lot easier. Hmm. All right. How many? Two. Two? I'd better hurry up. Right, there are um, some, I'll say that again. <laughs> with, with Red Hat in particular, we, we had a major issue when we came to run a standard Red Hat update and as a cautionary tale, we ran the update. Um, everything walked, worked, walked, worked wonderfully until we went for the reboot. And it didn't. In the end, it turned out that it, we need to remake the, the system map files, the boot files, because for some subtle reason, though the hardware was nearly identical to the, uh, the uh, uh, test system, the live system wasn't completely identical. And the RAID driver controller 
died. No discs, no booty, no nothing. So, something that you need to take on board from that is no amount of getting identical systems, testing stuff, is going to save you from that last minute stuff up. Because on the surface of these two machines, they looked identical. Doing, but they weren't. So, now's the time to fight and think. Think and think. That's what you're paid for. That's what we're in the game to do. We're trying to do it better than the next bloke. But we do need the support of each one of us interacting together through our news groups, through our uh, chat groups, through our online presences to really get in there. Now to wind it up with good old Foden. Now for wrath, now for ruin, now for a red dawn. We have to go out there and fight and win. And it's very important that we uh, think while we're doing it. Okay, back again. Uh, okay, I'm going to be, this is roughly a vague collection of thoughts about how I think system administrators should be thinking about as we go on, if only to enhance the way we work. Basically, if you go look at uh, recent history, well, computer, in terms of computer science from the, from the dark ages, system administration was pretty much defined in the early days and we really haven't moved too much past that. We said, okay, we are going to run stable systems. You have somebody who's dedicated to knowing the system. And on top of that, maybe we have added some version control, except in the last few years where configuration management is starting to become an issue. On the other hand, if you go look at the programming bits, pro programmers basically have kept on refining their data models. It started off with writing machine code, then they've kept on adding abstractions, assembly, procedural, then you take bunches of procedures together, throw your data structures in with them, con convert them into objects, and then you have the whole mathematical functional model. So we need to take some of these things at least into system administration stuff. You don't, you stop thinking in terms of saying, I have a web server or I have an application X. I prefer to think of it as saying there is something that renders service X or service Z, whatever I like. So the, tomorrow, if I want to change that particular component, it needs to be trivially isolatable. I don't want to depend on something that says the web server has to be Apache. That's a problem, uh, especially if it says it has to be Apache 1.2, and I can't do it with Apache 2.0, recent example. <laughs> so stuff like abstraction is something that we need to figure out. Stuff like... Uh, version controls, configuration managements, being able to think of your con a configuration file is just another program. When you are working on a command line, you're still programming. It's still pure logical application of thought. If we can't do that, we have other bigger problems. But basically the idea here is that we basically, uh, sorry, I'm saying basically too often here. <laughs> Uh, we need to come up with ideas that say, okay, I have this as a perfectly working abstraction, and now I'm going to keep on going around with this. There is that doc, if you go look at system administration textbooks for that matter, there isn't one which covers the general technical field of how to do a, how, how to become a sysadmin. Taposna, the practice of network and uh, system and network administration covers a lot of stuff, but it does not do anything technical. It doesn't teach you how to think like a system administrator. We don't have system administration for dummies. And a lot of people out there, basically, if you're running your own home computer, you are essentially being a system administrator out there, even if it's for just one machine. And a lot of people think in terms of single machines instead of thinking in terms of sets of machines. We are, if you go look at most of these Web 2.0 fancy companies like uh, YouTube or Facebook, these guys basically don't scale up vertically. It's not one box any longer. It's maybe a few dozen boxes, all of which are identical. 
management system, we don't have any kind of documentation on this. This is solved in the programming world. It's a solved problem in a parallel field which we have not yet bothered to think about too much. So I'm looking for inputs from the audience as well so on what sort of stuff we can take inputs on and how to bring about changes. Audience? For a large-scale system, uh, centralized configuration management's the only way. Anything else is just um, silly. You know, I think that uh, trying to back up the whole of every one of 500 servers totally is just madness. Trying to trying to uh, manage individual servers manually is madness, uh, and that uh, allowing uh, the, the system administrator really needs to be a software developer at the same time, developing some kind of um, developing the infrastructure for maintaining the configuration for all the servers so that you can just restore a server quickly. Just to take a completely opposite point of view, uh, you know, I think that um, that advanced systems configuration centralized systems for managing lots and lots of boxes can be overkill. Sometimes you don't have to. Sometimes everything's different. You know, the functions of different boxes have different things. Not everybody is administering 200 systems. You know, some people are only administering three uh, or, or, yeah, 500. But there are people at the other end of the scale as well. And, and centralized configuration systems don't always work. Sometimes they overcomplicate things. Um, you know, then you're maintaining the centralised configuration system as well, and when that's broken, what happens? If, you, if you've got centralised logins and you've got five machines that are distributed on five continents it, it w and your network breaks in some way, what happens to your authentication models? The, the, these sort of things are also problems. And uh, keeping it simple, you know, is something that should not be forgotten as well. W when you write a cron job, if it's more than 50 characters long, maybe you should put it in a shell script and write the cron job to call the shell script. You know, those sort of, those sort of heuristic things. If you write a cron job that runs every minute, you know, consider what happens when it's broken. Where does the output go? What happens if it ran, you know, it broke on Christmas Eve and nobody checked their mailbox until New Year's Day and suddenly they have uh, an email per minute for the last week? You know, the, the, Consider these sort of situations, which also happen. And what if it didn't happen on one machine and did happen on 500? And so they've got 500 emails every minute for a week. <laughs> uh, and, and then your mail server's broken because it ran out of space. So, yeah, the implications of even very simple things can, can have different effects depending on scale. And, and your approach can have different effects depending on scale too. Um, I'd, I'd ask the gentleman who just spoke uh, whether uh, if he's only got five machines on five different continents, has he considered the possibility of getting someone else to host them? <laughs> I mean, really. But uh, the question I was going to ask was, uh, you've talked a lot, especially in your talk this morning, about configuration management, centralised configuration management. Um, do you see, because this is something that I'm developing at the moment, do you see there being a potential for... Uh, deployment management, centralised deployment management. So you can say, in addition to being able to puppet style, say, uh, these machines have these users with these characteristics, for example. Um, you could also say, oh, uh, I've got five new pieces of hardware, I need three Apache servers with these characteristics and two mail servers with those characteristics, check the boxes and start the build. You know, um, uh, as opposed to manually, you know, the, the figures you were quoting this morning, I think, were, was it three months before, before optimization for a system build? Uh, not three months for optimizing it, more than three months to convert everything from co source compiled into packages. Yeah. Right. Um, right.
Cobbler. Yeah. I just wanted to add to a comment that was mentioned down the front about system admins thinking more like software developers. One of my personal experiences is that we have to get much more involved with developers if they're not if they're not inside your company or even if they're a separate group. Because um, many times I found that the developers said it works fine, yeah, it works in his test system, but then um, it comes into my environment and it doesn't work because the DNS isn't the same or the Active Directory controller isn't out in the DMZ. It's not a surprise for me, but it is to the developers. So as sysadmins. To advance our cause, we have to start working much more closely with developers, I think, and educating developers that they have to set up environments like we do in production environments for their testing so that it works, not just on their four virtual machines or little test lab they've got, but will work in a real environment that we run. of some Rails applications and um, those proxy servers started mucking around with the HTTP requests and because they did that then all the caching in the uh, Rails application went to, went to pot. So it's really important to actually have a build of the production environment and then just um, keep getting the early builds of the, the software through there so that you've got some confidence and some surety and some success, you know, the developers use continuous integration to get their success and surety. And we need something that's similar so that we can say, well, okay, we've deployed your application a hundred times. We know this is okay.